All right, uh, my topic for um, today is on monetary inflation. Uh, it's slightly different from what is uh, given as a title. Uh, what I want to do is concentrate on how uh, economic fascism came to the United States between the Kennedy and Nixon administrations and how monetary inflation was instrumental in, in this development. Um, so I will be talking about the F word. Okay, this is a word that's not used in American political discourse, but that is very, very applicable. Uh, what, is, what is economic fascism? It's a very strong term. Uh, it's, it's, it's emotionally laden. Uh, but, but we can define it so that it, it, it can be scientifically useful, so that it can, um, so that it can uh, identify a particular uh, structure of policies. The best definition of economic fascism was given by the great was given by the great uh, John T. John T. Flynn, the, the American journalist and essayist of the old right, in his classic work, which I highly recommend, as we uh, as we go marching, okay, which was published in 1944, Flynn enumerated what he called the essential ingredients of fascism. Okay, uh, the first was a spending borrowing government. Which, which borrowed and spent huge sums on, on welfare programs. The second ingredient was mi militarism. Not in the sense of, of defense, but in the sense of, of a huge spending program, okay? An economic institution. The third ingredient was imperialism, which was the obvious handmaiden of militarism. And finally, or rather the fourth was a planned economy involving direct government interference with prices, wages, rents, and interest rates. Now, Flynn referred to these first four ingredients as the prologue to fascism, okay? Today, we would refer to the first three of them, okay, leaving aside the planned economy. We'd refer to the first three as the welfare warfare state. And with the four ingredients together, including the planned economy, we'd call that economic fascism. Now, what Flynn did was to add two other ingredients. He said the fifth one was a totalitarian state, and the sixth one was what he called the leadership principle, the Fuhrer principle, the Duce principle in Italy, uh, simply dictatorship. All right, so far so good. But Flynn made a crucial mistake in further claiming that economic fascism, that is the first four ingredients, could not last very long without being ruthlessly imposed by, the, by a totalitarian dictator. In other words, what Flynn was saying was that there was no middle ground between full totalitarian fascism and the free market, okay? His argument was that as soon as the public was hit with the bill for the, for the welfare warfare state, they would rise up in a glorious tax rebellion and either abolish it or be crushed by a, a dictator. Now, let me just um, read you Flynn's words here. What he said was, of course, businessmen and individuals will resist such taxes. The free society knows such a device as a tax strike. Only in a totalitarian state can these oppressive laws be imposed and enforced. And even in such a state, there is a limit. But the limit in the free um, society is swiftly reached. It is for this reason, and there are other reasons as well, that I make the statement that this managed, public debt-supported autarky must turn to the totalitarian government or abandon its plans. Now, would that that were so, okay, but Flynn was actually wrong about this. Um, he was misled. He was misled by an inadequate definition of economic fascism, for he left out, really, its most important ingredient, and that was monetary inflation. There was no talk at all in his book of, of inflation, only of deficits and large spending. Okay, that is the unrestrained ability the unrestrained creation of fiat money by, by government. Uh, because if a democratic government could finance its deficit spending on domestic welfare and military adventurism around the globe, if it could finance it by creating money, then it could effectively hide the true costs from its citizens for years, uh, during which economic fascism could thrive under mass democracy, that is, without a totalitarian dictator. A second problem with Flynn's definition is that it does not provide the causal mechanism by which the huge government deficits and spending programs, that is the welfare warfare state, transform a free market economy eventually into a planned economy, that is into full fascism.
Uh, because deficit spending and massive budgets need not result in the abolition of the market, uh, as, we see, uh, as we see today. They, they need not do that. Okay. Um, what provides the, uh, the explanation of that transformation? Well, in fact, it, it's again monetary inflation. Okay. Once the consequences of monetary inflation become visible after four or five years or longer, and we be ha begin to have rapidly rising prices, at that point, the government may react by seeking to suppress the symptoms by turning to first voluntary wage and price restraints uh, and then later by imposing mandatory wage and price controls. But when you get mandatory wage and price controls, which you had in, in, in Nazi Germany and fascist Italy, it's tantamount to abolishing the market and instituting central planning. Thus, contrary to Flynn, economic fascism will not necessarily give rise almost immediately to dictatorship or be destroyed by political forces such as a tax strike. Economic fascism will evolve slowly as monetary inflation and its undesirable consequences compel more thoroughgoing interferences into the price system. Now to illustrate this thesis, I will sur uh, survey the march toward, com toward economic fascism in the U.S. From, from, from John F. Kennedy's New Economics to Richard M. Nixon's New Economic Policy in which a wage price freeze was imposed. Let me give you a macro view of, of the march of economic fascism in the 1960s and early 70s. Let's start with the Eisenhower administration. And, and I have a much greater respect for Eisenhower after having do, done this paper. Okay. Um, Eisenhower did reverse a, a great deal of, of the New Deal legislation. Um, he cut actually cut real cuts, not just cuts in the rate of spending. He actually cut the government's uh, budget three times uh, during his administration. Nonetheless, by the end of his administration, 1960, government expenditures had risen from $68 billion to $92 billion. Okay. Uh, in total, that was about a 35% increase in government spending. Um, the percent change was about 4.4% a year. Now, since there was some inflation, that meant that the government grew in real terms, it became bigger by less than 1% per year. Now, that's dismaying, okay, but it's not catastrophic. What happened under Kennedy? Under Kennedy, government spending during his three years arose from $92 billion to $111 billion, okay, which now was about a 20% total increase and a 7% increase per year. That meant that government was growing in real terms at about 4.5% per year. Kennedy ran up total deficits of $15 billion, or about $5 billion a year. What about Johnson? The government spending exploded under Johnson, went from a total of $111 billion to $178 billion, from 63 to 68. Um, that was a total percent increase of about 60%, and a 12% increase per year. Uh, real government grew by about 7.5%, okay, a full 2% above um, what, what it grew under Kennedy. Total deficits were $42 billion over those years. So that gave us about an $8.4 billion deficit per year. Now, under the Nixon administration, there was a tremendous explosion in government spending, $178 billion to $269 billion, from 69 to 74. Um, Government spending was gr grew about 51 percent, growing about eight 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 and a half percent per year. Um, however, since it was tremendous inflation under Nixon, we had the government growing at, at only in real terms about one percent. Okay, so in, in in general, from 1960 to 1964, we had an increase in government spending from 92 billion to 269 billion dollars. That is, government spending tripled during those years. So we had that component of fascism, a tremendous increase in government spending programs. Uh, we also had total deficits during those years of $115 billion. Okay. What about militarism, the other component, militarism and imperialism? Okay, the second and third components or ingredients of fascism. Uh, in 1957, the uh, Soviet Union launched Sputnik 1 and then uh, successfully tested ICBMs in August of 1957. Suddenly, there were claims that there was a missile gap, and that the U.S. had to rearm. Those turned out to be a lie in 1961. 
fact is, I'll talk about a little bit later if I have time, uh, Kennedy's new economists were really instrumental in spreading this lie about a missile gap, okay, especially James Tobin. Uh, in any case, defense expenditures under Eisenhower fell. They went from 90s, now, again, at the beginning of his, of his regime, there was a, we were, you know, there was a Korean War going on. Uh, but they fell from almost $100 billion down to $72 billion, okay? So they had fallen tremendously by about 25% in real terms. The military was actually cut under Eisenhower. I'm, so, I'm sorry, I cursed him all these years. Well, let's jump to the Vietnam War. Okay, we got into a war. Uh, the war didn't really heat up until 1965. <clears throat> there were a lot of lies about the course of the war before, as we were getting more and more involved in 1964. Johnson and McNamara conspired to keep the course hidden from the, uh, uh, from the American people. They explicitly conspired. You want to look at a book called Dereliction of Duty, and I can't remember the, the author's name right now, but he's a, a major at West Point. And a historian is very, very good on these lies. It costs in total, budgetary costs, for $140 billion. Okay. Uh, that, in 1968 and 1969, the Vietnam War absorbed about 3.2% each year of the U.S. GNP. That was about nine times the value of, of, of the North Vietnamese GNP. Just that 3.2% that was absorbed of the, of the U.S. So we spent nine times the value on, on the war of, of, of the whole product produced in North Vietnam. Okay. Now, how was the Vietnam War paid for? This is very interesting. Uh, before we get into that, let me just talk a little bit about the inflation situation, which I haven't referred to yet. Okay, this is my own ingredient that I add to Flynn's uh, description of, of economic fascism. Under um, Eisenhower, we did have inflation, uh, the, the, amount, uh, the monetary inflation I'm referring to now, the increase in the money supply, was about 3.3% per year. Okay? Again, that's a dismaying figure. Under a gold standard, the money supply would be, be decreasing by much less than that, and prices would actually be falling. Under Kennedy, it jumped up to 8% per year, okay? the increase in the money supply, as measured if you're interested by M2 which is really all our currency, checking account money, and savings accounts. Uh, under Johnson, that figure was 7.6%, and under Nixon, 8.3% per year. So over those years, the money supply increased by 8.1%, which is unprecedented in peacetime. Okay? This is very important. Uh, because what has happened was that if you take the total um, deficits okay, for all of those years... A great part of those deficits were paid for by printing up new money. So let me give you some figures on that. Okay. Under, under Eisenhower, the total deficits were $18 billion. Okay. Now, one dollar of those deficits were paid for by an increase in the money supply. Okay. The increase in the money supply that did occur under Eisenhower didn't, re didn't come from the Fed buying up, printing up new money and, 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 and buying up government bonds. Okay. It came because the Fed was, was reducing the... Um, uh, reserve requirements. Okay. However, things changed. Under Kennedy, about two billion of the fifteen billion dollar deficits were paid for by new money. Okay, it's about fourteen percent. Uh, by the time we got to Nixon, the Fed printed up over those years about thirty four billion new dollars to pay for the deficits of fifty eight billion. That's about fifty eight percent. In total, there were one hundred and fifteen billion dollars worth of deficits during this development of fascism in the sixties and seventies. Fifty-two billion were paid for by the Fed buying government securities. That came out to about forty-five and a half percent. Now let's let's look at that with relation to the Vietnam War. As I said, the budget costs of the Vietnam War was one hundred and forty billion dollars, right? Deficits during those years were ninety-five billion dollars. So the Vietnam War was paid for to the tune of about sixty-seven percent, two-thirds of the Vietnam War was not paid for by higher taxes, but by government deficits. And of those deficits, about 50% was paid for by printing up new money, not borrowing from the public. So in total, about 35% of, of the Vietnam War 
was a very costly war, was paid for by the printing up of new money. Had Americans gotten the bill much sooner in the form of much higher taxes, had taxes been raised by the full $140 billion cost, okay, rather than only a third of that, uh, the pipe would have had to been paid much earlier. It would have been much more resistance to the war. Okay? So economic fascism is able to fasten itself on a society through monetary inflation. Uh, <clears throat> now, there was a further way in which the... Uh, the government, Johnson uh, and Nixon in particular, hid the costs from, from the American public. And that was the Bretton Woods system. The American dollar was considered to be as good as gold, so that when Americans printed up new dollars, when the Fed printed up those new dollars, prices in the United States didn't rise that much. We didn't get inflation right away. What happened was, as soon as our, 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 our products became slightly more costly than foreign products, we began to buy those foreign products. So these dollars flowed out of the United States, and they weren't returned, which they could have been, to uh, be converted to gold. The United States legally was bound to pay out gold to foreign governments and central banks for dollars. Okay? But that didn't happen because foreign governments trusted us. They believed the dollar was as good as gold. From 1965, when the, the Vietnam War began to heat up, until 1973, we had total deficits of $50 billion. That is, we sent to foreign governments... $50 billion worth of depreciating paper, and they sent us $50 billion worth of goods. So they paid the real cost of the war, remember, $140 billion. In real terms, foreigners paid $50 billion, about 40% or so, of the war in real terms. Okay? <clears throat> so that further lightened the perceived burden of the war on the American public. When we were asked to, to, later on, of course, now when they send the dollars back and you pay gold or you have to pay in, in, in products, then you see the real burden. But Nixon took care of that by closing the gold window in 1971 and declaring those dollars inconvertible. Okay? <clears throat> now, <clears throat> we did begin to get some price inflation. The price inflation was very, very mild from 61 to 65 under President Kennedy. Now, his advisors, the Keynesian New Economists, Paul Samuelson, James Tobin, Arthur Oaken, uh, and a few other uh, individuals, uh, Walter Heller in particular, uh, they were chortling, they were, they were, they, they were ecstatic that, that prices really didn't go up. They had convinced Kennedy to run deficits, to lower the unemployment rate, to move us away from the bad old uh, Eisenhower days, and, which Kennedy did, and the money supply was increasing, as I said, by about 8%, but yet prices were only going up by 1.3% per year, very, very low rate of inflation. Okay? There were two reasons for this, neither of which had to do with uh, the wisdom of, of the new economists. The first was that our GNP was growing at very, very rapid rates. We were coming out of a, of a recession in 1960. So there's a lot of room for the economy to grow, okay? which meant that a lot of that new money then was spent on these goods and it didn't, pu it didn't push up prices. Secondly, uh, the American public. Um, saw that prices weren't going up by that, that much, but they were going up somewhat. And at the beginning of any inflation, what the public tends to do is to hold some of this new money because they believe that prices will go down in the future. So they're going to hold the money until they can spend it at lower prices because it's more beneficial when you buy things at lower prices. So for those two reasons, we didn't have much price inflation. All that changed with the relentless inflation going on during the 60s. That began to change in 1966. From 66 to 74, we had um, about 5.5% price inflation. Okay, now, now, now the administration, Johnson and Nixon, began to get worried. Um, it was in this later period, as I'll show you in a moment, that the U.S. economy took a giant leap towards fascism. Now let me mention that the ideological foundations of fascism were laid in the late 1950s by, by, by the Keynesian New Economists, okay, Tobin, Heller, okay, Oaken, okay, Samuelson, these names should be named. These were young liberal economists from Eastern Establishment Universities like Harvard, Yale, MIT, who believed that the Eisenhower administration was a temporary interruption of the permanent New Deal. So wait, they, they, were, there, they were here to restore the New Deal. And they had a lot of influence on Kennedy. As I said, they did influence him to spend... Tremendous amounts 
and not to worry about raising taxes, okay, to spend uh, with deficits. In fact, their first success occurred in 1961 during the Berlin crisis, okay, when the U.S. mobilized, when, when the Soviet Union uh, threatened to restrict access to uh, West Berlin. The U.S. mobilized, and Kennedy initially was going to ask for a $3.2 billion increase in taxes to pay for that mobilization. The new economists worked on him over the weekend, um, and uh, browbeat him into uh, rescinding that request for a tax increase so that he paid for it simply through deficit spending. And they said, look, the economy uh, can still use uh, more stimulation, so any spending, e even and especially on military um, uh, defense and so on, is stimulative. So don't worry about raising taxes. Don't raise taxes. And in fact, he didn't. That was their first uh, important um, victory and the first step towards economic fascism. Now, I don't want to get into too much detail, but in, in the 1958, James Tobin, uh, who was on the CEA, the Council of Economic Advisors for Kennedy, wrote an article called Dollars uh, and Defense and, uh, and claimed that the uh, Eisenhower administration was irresponsibly allowing a missile gap to develop and that, um, in fact, all the, that, that, that all the arguments that uh, greater spending on military budgets would, would, would bring about deficits and so on were ridiculous because, look, if the government issued debt, as, as Tobin said, it was all in the family. We owed it to ourselves. Okay. If we had inflation, he said, well... Inflation is bad, but there are the worst things. Juvenile delinquency, a lack of medical care, okay, the usual list that the liberals will give you. And he said, in any way, we have the highest and most frivolous, this is 1958. I don't remember, remember living that high off the hog in 1958, but he said, we have the highest and most frivolous standard of living ever. And, and uh, the spending on consumer goods is really pure waste at this point. Much of it is pure waste. So... In, in, in some sense, we could almost buy more military defense without having any, um, without really losing any product. Okay. Well, this is from a tenured, highly compensated Yale professor. By 1962, Kennedy. Um, oh, one other point I want to make very, very quickly about the uh, the new economists. They also had a, came up with a, an odd theory of inflation, and that was that inflation not only occurred when, when the Fed increased the money supply and when we had too much spending in the economy, but it also occurred when unions and, and big business greedily pushed up their wages and prices. Okay? Because when that happened, you began to have higher costs in the economy and therefore higher prices. Okay? They never asked themselves if people, without any more money, if people had to spend to pay higher prices for certain products, they would have less money for other products. So inflation couldn't occur. Some prices would go up, other prices would go down. Okay. But they needed this explanation of inflation to explain what had happened in the late 1950s. In the late 1950s, we had a higher unemployment rate. We went into a recession in the late 1950s. And we had higher inflation. But that contradicts Keynes. Keynes said, you have higher inflation if there's too much spending. Okay? Uh, if there's too little spending, you have higher unemployment. Now we had both together. They couldn't explain that. So they came up with this crazy, absurd cost push cost push inflation explanation. That is that it's greedy businesses and unions pushing up their wages and prices uh, and, and causing unemployment as well as higher prices. Now, why do I bring that in? Because they came up with a solution to that. They said that the real problem with inflation now and in the foreseeable future will be the cost push variety. So we don't have to worry about the Fed increasing the money supply. In fact, the Fed should increase the money supply and keep interest rates low so businesses could borrow more and produce. What we do have to worry about is cost push. So what we need is an incomes policy, which is a very gentle term for, for uh, wage and price controls. But they realized that American, the American public wouldn't swallow wage and price controls, okay? especially after the bad experiences with them during wartime. So they talked about voluntary wage-priced guideposts. 
So this, of course, is the final ingredient in economic fascism, right? This is, this is the takeover of the economy, the interference with uh, uh, specific wage and price in the, uh, decisions by the central government. So the first time that this was tested out was the, um, the steel confrontation in 1962 that Kennedy had with um, the steel industry. Um, these guideposts had called for wage increases of only 3.2%, okay, no more than that, because labor productivity was increasing in the economy by 3.2%, which meant that if wages went up by 3.2%, costs wouldn't go up because labor was more productive to that extent. And they went on to say that prices in industries where you have an above average increase in productivity, where even more was being produced per, per laborer, they should lower their prices. That was the guidepost. Uh, and in the, in the slow productivity growth industries, they, should ra they could raise their prices. Remember now, the money supply is raging at 8% per year. Okay? Of course prices are going to be going up. Okay? But of course, th this focusing only on cost push inflation, the Keynesian economists claim that, um, no, 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 prices should be falling in some industries and going up slightly in other industries. Okay, uh, what, what happened? Um, in, 19, in September 1961, Kennedy, at the urging of, of, of Walter Heller and the CEA, sent letters to 12 major steel firms, um, threat, or prodding them to hold the line on prices. Okay. The CEA, um, Council of Economic Advisors, by reading, believe it or not, popular mechanics, believed that they knew enough about the steel industry to lecture the steel executives. They told them that with the new technology they were instituting, a description of which they got from popular mechanics, uh, that they should be earning 7 to 9 percent profit during that year without raising their prices, and that certainly was sufficient. Okay. Well, the steel industry gave in for the moment, but they did something real neat. Um, the Kennedy administration got involved in, in negotiations in 1962 with, um, between the steel industry and the unions, <clears throat> and they put pressure on the unions to take a wage increase that was within their so-called guidelines. Okay. What happened? Two weeks after the conclusion of no negotiations, U.S. Steel heroically announced a price increase of $6 per ton. Okay. Of course, this greatly embarrassed the Kennedy administration, okay. and their reaction was swift and vicious. He, Kennedy reportedly declared to his advisors, quote, my father told me that all businessmen were SOBs. Well, actually he said sons of bitches. But I never believed it until now. Kennedy later claimed in an interview he meant he said steel men. After all, he said, my father was a businessman too. Well, I guess that's so if you can account liquor bootleggers as businessmen. <clears throat> The next day, he gave a demagogic talk to the nation bashing the steel industries. Uh, and um, basically, he went on to say, uh, it was a serious hour in our nation's history when we are confronted with grave crises in Berlin and Southeast Asia, when we are devoting our energies to economic recovery and stability, when we are asking reservists to leave their homes and families for months on end, and servicemen to risk their lives, and asking union members to hold down their wage requests at a time when restraint and sacrifice are being asked of every citizen. The American people will find it hard, as I do, to accept the situation in which a tiny handful of steel executives whose pursuit of private power and profit exceeds their sense of public responsibility can show such utter contempt for the interests of 185 million Americans. A few gigantic corporations have decided to increase prices in utter disregard of their public responsibilities. Responsibilities to whom? Not to embarrass uh, an inflationist proto-fascist regime, maybe. Now, um, <clears throat> now, it wasn't just words, okay? The, the Kennedy administration, the next 72 hours, followed up with the following actions. They, they jawboned or pressured a number of the smaller steel companies not to increase prices, so as to undercut the steel price increase. Attorney General Robert Kennedy subpoenaed U.S. Steel and other companies to produce records for a grand jury. The FBI began to look into rumors that the Bethlehem Steel president had previously issued a statement against a price increase and then suspiciously changed his mind. Senator Estes Kefauver agreed to conduct an antitrust investigation of the steel industry, and the FTC suddenly decided to open an investigation of the industry's compliance with an agreement uh, not to 
collude in 1951. Also, McNamara announced that the Defense Department had ordered defense contractors to transfer steel purchases to companies that had not raised prices. Within three days, U.S. Steel and Bethlehem Steel rescinded the announced price increases. Okay. So this was the first small step towards a planned economy. What happened was, and I'll, I'll skip skipping ahead here, was that the Vietnam War heated up. Okay. In 1964, President Johnson and, and McNamara deliberately understated the budgetary costs and refused to ask for a tax increase. Johnson did, wanted to avoid um, the stigma of, of imposing a war tax, he, he used those terms, um, on the American people before the election of 1964. Okay? So the war was to be paid for in great part, as I, I pointed out before, by deficits and money creation. After he was reelected, Johnson and McNamara widened the war and deepened American involvement in it while continuing to lie about its costs. Johnson now wanted to avoid a, a tax increase because he was fearful it would interfere with his domestic rate society programs. Now, Johnson describes his dilemma a number of years later in the following interesting terms. Let me just read that. He said, I knew from the start that I was bound to be crucified either way I moved. If I left the woman I loved, the Great Society, in order to get involved with that bitch of a war on the other side of the world, then I would lose everything at home, all my programs, all my hopes to feed the hungry and shelter the homeless, all my dreams to provide education and medical care to the browns and the blacks and the lame and the poor. But if I left that war and let the communists take over South Vietnam, then I would be seen as a coward and my nation would be seen as an appeaser. And we would both find it impossible to accomplish anything for anybody anywhere on the globe. Now here we have it, the foul-mouthed, corn-pwned, corrupt machine politician as frustrated global messiah who would feed the poor and heal the lame with counterfeited money. Okay, after he was... Um, Johnson, having... This, having been caught on this dilemma, <clears throat> prices began to rapidly rise as, as, as money creation continued, and he, uh, Johnson also resorted to the same uh, um, tactic that Kennedy did, okay, that is jawboning, threatening the aluminum and copper industries if they raised prices. But eventually, price increases um, became stratospheric, or at least by, by that standards then, and uh, so the, the wage price controls went by the wayside. Okay. The, the voluntary guideposts. Okay, let me get to Nixon. Now, after Nixon took office, a recession occurred in 69-70. The Fed began to in aggressively increase the money supply in 1970. Okay. But price, prices, well, prices continued to rise in 1970. Unemployment began to rise. Okay. In other words, we began to have stagflation raising its ugly head. Um, even though we were recovering from the recession by 1971, Unemployment increased by 1% from about 5% to 6%. Okay, very, very high level of unemployment. At the same time, the rate of inflation was very, very high during this time. Now, the conservative, quote-unquote, Arthur Burns took over the Fed in 1970 and began clamoring for mandatory wage and price controls. This was the same Arthur Burns who in the mid-60s attacked the Keynesian new, new economists for, uh, for their voluntary wage uh, price guideposts. I guess when you get, a, you get a clearer view of things when you sit on high in the, in the seat of power. Now, Burns promised Nixon he would gun the money supply and rapidly reduce unemployment if Nixon would institute controls. With, with presidential election little more than a year away, Nixon needed lower inflation and lower unemployment in order to get reelected. Okay. Uh, Burns was as good as his word, the money supply exploded by 13.5% per year okay, in 1971. That hadn't happened since World War II, that, that, that rate. And also by 13% by in 1972, the year of the election. Now, in return, of course, Nixon then on August... Do I have two more minutes on this? Because I have a... Oh, good. Seven more minutes. How many more minutes? Six. Okay. 
I, I'll only take five. On August 15th, 1971, we had the real day of infamy in the U.S. Okay? This was when full economic fascism came to the U.S. during peacetime, not during a war. I mean, FDR had the, 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 the excuse of the war, of, 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 a, of, a, of a total war in bringing uh, economic fascism. The interesting thing is that no one uttered a peep, okay, except for one courageous exception. The business, and especially big business, were all for the um, price controls, the, the, the wage price freeze, because it promised to effectively hold down wage increases. Okay? They bought into the Keynesian nonsense about uh, inflation being caused by uh, cost push inflation. Okay? Of course, the, um, the Keynesian new economists loved these, these mandatory controls because it vindicated their own position. Okay? It vindicated their failed wage price guideposts. They said the only problem with our with our um, uh, program was that it wasn't, it was voluntary. Okay. But just as, as, as a Republican president can, go, can get away with going to, uh, to, uh, to um, China, uh, whereas a Democrat never could get away with it, so a Republican president could also get away with imposing mandatory controls, something we would have liked to do, uh, to have done, but we weren't able to. Uh, big labor did, be, did balk at first, because Nixon hadn't, put any controls on profits and dividends, okay? But they said they were willing to cooperate with this as long as, as profits and dividends were brought in. Only, uh, and, and by the way, free market economists were strangely si silent. Milton Friedman mildly criticized the controls as inefficient, and 16 Chicago school economists wrote an open letter against it, okay? But most of the other economists were, were silent. Only Murray Rothbard spoke out passionately against the controls as inefficient and unjust, and fearlessly use the F word, fascism, um, which isn't used in, in, in polite political discourse. In fact, Murray had predicted the move to Nixonite fascism seven months in advance. And what I want to end with is just some of the stirring um, writing on this that, that, that Murray did. Uh, a full seven months before we had the um, controls imposed, Murray already saw the tendency towards fascism in the Nixon uh, regime. He said... Well, we've had two years of Nixonism, and what are we undergoing, and what we are undergoing is a super great society. In fact, what we are seeing is the greatest single thrust towards socialism since the days of Franklin Roosevelt. It is not Marxian socialism, to be sure, but neither was FDR's. It is a big business socialism, or state corporatism. That was the name for Mussolini's program. Um, uh, but that is cold comfort indeed. Right? And then he goes on to say... Um, not only is it impossible for direct controls to work, now he's, he's forecasting that we're going to have these, their imposition adds a final link in the forging of a totalitarian economy, of an American fascism. What is it but totalitarian to outlaw any sort of voluntary exchange, any voluntary sale of a product, or hiring of a labor? Uh, then, when the controls were actually implemented, Murray reacted with the following. He said, there is only one word for this new economic policy. That was the name that Nixon gave it. A word that is at first glance harsh and exaggerated, but it is, but it, but is in fact precisely appropriate. That word is fascism. A system of permanent price and wage controls administered by a central government bureaucracy, probably headed by some form of tripartite board, including big business, big labor, and big government. This is precisely what fascism is. Precisely the economic system of Mussolini's Italy, and Hitler's Germany. This is the economy of the corporate state, ad administered by dictation from the top, controlled and monopolized by big business and big union interests, with the individual and the consumer, the person who suffers. In short, the mass of American public will suffer from this system of corporate statism, from the death of the free price system, from the invasion of individual rights, from the hampering of growth, efficiency, and productivity that the system will entail. Now, Murray did see, like Flynn saw, that after a while, the, the operation of the system would include uh, a, a leader, a dictator. And so uh, I'll close with this. He said, there's also the Caesarism involved in the freeze by presidential edict. If the president can simply go on TV and unilater unilaterally declare an immediate freeze, then all of our liberties, moral, political, and constitutional, are truly gone. If the president can do this, then he is truly another Caesar, another Mussolini, another Hitler. His power is then absolute. Is our Constitution completely forgotten? 
Are we going to put up passively with a slide into absolute presidential dictatorship? And by what stretch of constitutional finagling can the, the president freeze local rents? What gives him the power to freeze rents in Peoria? Uh, where is interstate commerce here? Are there to be no restraints on the president's absolute power? Okay, I'll, I'll close there. Thank you. Thank you.